Okay. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us um, this evening or this morning or this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, we're just going to wait a few minutes just for the room to fill up a little bit more and then we'll get started on this panel discussion. It's set to be a really interesting one. We've got some uh, great speakers lined up for you and um, some great topics to discuss as well. Um, hi, Charlie. Um, nice to see you. If you are joining us and you'd like to say hello to um, everyone in the room, please go ahead and leave um, a comment in the chat box on the, the right hand side of the screen. Um, it'd be nice to see who's here and where you're from. Tell us who you are and where in the world you are as well. Um, we will be running a Q&A too, so if you have any specific questions throughout the course of this uh, session, then please do leave the questions. We'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, please don't be offended if we don't quite manage to get to your question. If there's anything particularly important, we can try and follow up with you afterwards. Um, okay, I think we're we're filling up quite nicely. So what I'm going to do is. Um, pass over to um, Heidi Dylan Otto, uh, Managing Director for Distill Ventures in the Americas. Hi, Heidi. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm out in California, so morning for me, while hopefully many of you are enjoying a whiskey during our session this evening. Great. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody for joining. Very glad to have you here. Um, as Becky mentioned, I'm Heidi. I'm the Managing Director of North America. Um, I have been with Distill Ventures for just about three years and started with leading our North American non-alcoholic practice and now have the broader role of managing director for North America. So work on our whiskey businesses amongst um, many others. So for those of you who aren't familiar with DV, we are the world's first drinks accelerator and we work on four different pillars um, of acceleration, but most importantly, we have a dedicated practice in whiskey. So in-house, we have a team of experts who have really focused their careers in this area, and we're really excited to be able to offer such a unique perspective um, and breadth here. We also have a really wonderful portfolio of whiskeys, um, some of which you may know, including Stowning, Starward, and Westward, which are public facing, um, but many others uh, beyond that. We had our first inaugural um, whiskey session a few months ago, which I assume some of you attended was really wonderful. And this was on a promising segment that we see in whiskey called New World Whiskey. Uh, we shared some great research and that is all available on our website. But a couple of things that led us to the session today um, is really about the growth that we see in this area, you know, whiskeys, the liquid quality, the variety of styles, diverse founders, stories, aspirations, um, really interesting what we found in that session. Um, with some of the research we presented then, you know, we found, of course, there are many whiskey drinkers out there, but 36% 30 of them are female and also, you know, crossing a wide range of age, age segments. So really interesting to see uh, some of those stats. So we're going to dive into this a bit more today. Uh, today, we are here to tackle a timely topic. You know, as a company and society and at DV, we're very focused on inclusion and diversity, you know, now more than ever. And this is something we really think is important to look at in the whiskey category. So today, we thought we'd tap it to uh, tackle this relevant topic around gender diversity. And we're really excited to have some incredible female founders and thought leaders with us today um, in the whiskey category. So with that, I'll leave it off to you, Becky, to lead our amazing panel. And thanks uh, to all of you amazing women for joining us today. We're so proud to have you with us. Great, thank you so much, Heidi. Um, as, as Heidi uh, mentioned, we've got a great panel and great lineup for you today. It's going to be a really interesting discussion. Just a couple of housekeeping um, items for people who've just joined us. Feel free to use the chat box um, on the side there. Let us know where in the world you are and uh, say hello to everyone as you come in. We're joined by people from all around the world, which is amazing to see. Um, there's also a Q&A function. So if you have any questions for our panel or anything you'd like to raise, then um, please do leave a question there. We'll try and get through as many of them as possible. 
Um, thank you so much to Distill Ventures for the opportunity to uh, discuss um, this uh, very timely issue, as, as Heidi said. Um, for, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Becky Paskin. I'm a whiskey writer and communicator and co-founder of Our Whiskey, which is a campaign and soon-to-be educational platform designed to uh, celebrate diversity, champion inclusion and recognise the modern face of whiskey. And before I introduce our panel this evening, um, I'd just like to give a bit of background as to why we're here. So the global whisky industry, as we know, is more diverse than ever, uh, with women working in all aspects of whisky making, marketing, distribution and sales. More women are also enjoying whisky. There's been a 15% increase since 2010, with women now accounting for around 35% of whisky drinkers. Women are undoubtedly an increasingly important demographic for the industry, yet it is still widely considered a man's world. This perception is limiting opportunities for the industry to recruit the best talent and encourage more women to enjoy the wonderful drinks we produce. Sadly, in many situations, it also encourages gender bias and sexist attitudes. There are, of course, some fantastic examples of companies and brands that are addressing this issue through the implementation of diversity and inclusion policies uh, and equal representation in marketing campaigns. But there is still a long way to go. And that's why discussions like this have never been more important. I've got a bit of homework for you all to do at the start here. So um, I'm going to say it now, I'll remind you at the end, but after this seminar, I'd like you all to open up a tab in your browser and just do a quick Google image search for terms like whiskey distiller or whiskey drinker and uh, just reflect on what you see because there'll no doubt be a lot of images of bottles and barrels and stills uh, and as well as people making or drinking whiskey but I can guarantee that less than 10% will feature a woman. So how do we address this as individual companies? Uh, and as a collective global industry. What steps do we need to be taking to action progressive meaningful change? How do we inspire, empower and provide access to opportunities for women within the workplace and particularly in leadership positions? Hopefully we'll be answering some of these questions this evening. Um, I'm honoured, really honoured, to be joined by five of the most inspiring women in the whisky industry who uh, represent a, a variety of different markets and roles. Um, I'm going to uh, let them introduce themselves and give us an overview of, of what they do within the industry. And I'm going to go around my screen in a kind of uh, clockwise manner. So uh, Julie Bramham, who is Global uh, Brand Director for Johnny Walker based in Amsterdam. Hi, Julie. Hi Becky, Heidi, thanks for the intro, great to be here. Um, so I am the Global Brand Director for Johnny Walker, so basically I look after brand Johnny Walker and how that shows up all around the world from packaging through to communication, through to innovation, product development, um, it's a lot. Uh, and it's a, it's a great privilege to be here on this panel, actually. Lots of people with diverse experience, so really looking forward to getting into the discussion. Great, thanks so much, Julie. Uh, I'm going to go down now to uh, Hill Ying Si, who is founder of Whiskies and More, a distributor based out in Hong Kong. Hi, Hill. Uh, hi. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Very uh, happy to be here. So uh, I'm Hill, I'm a founder of Whiskies and More, a company that distributes um, independent and family owned um, whiskey brands in Hong Kong and Macau. Um, as a one women band, I do actually literally everything from selecting the whiskies to importing, to marketing, to advertising and sales. Um, started about five years ago and uh, so far so good. I'm happy with that. Fantastic, great to have you here, Hill. Um, next on to uh, Christy Lark Booth, uh, who joins us from uh, Tasmania. Christy is the owner and head distiller of Calara Distillery, and also the founder and president of the Australian Women in Distilling Association. Hi, Christy. Good morning or good evening. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> great to be part of this panel. It's um, quite early here in, in Tassie and got um, our brand new puppy distillery dog who's scrambling around at my feet at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's really exciting to be part of this panel. As you mentioned, I'm the owner and manager of Kalara Distillery. I uh, pretty much run that on my own, uh, which is exciting. Uh, it's also massive growth at the moment. And I'm the president of the Australian Women in Distilling Association, which 
the industry, which is a really, it's a growth area in Australia at the moment. Definitely is. You know, I, I, I think it's so exciting what's happening around the world and uh, the New World Whiskey seminar that we had um, about a couple of months ago now with Distilled Ventures was so interesting and so exciting. I love what's happening with Australia at the moment. Um, moving on around my screen, uh, we're going to land on Laura Davies, who is the distillery manager at Penderyn Distillery in Wales. Hi, Laura. Hello. Great to be here. It's great to be part of such an important discussion. Um, so I'm Laura. I'm distillery manager at Pandaren. I've been there now for around eight years. Um, and my role basically includes every part of the distillery operation um, that you can think of from malt sourcing, um, technical parameters within the distillery, staff management, health and safety, um, spirit quality, um, that all of that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, yeah. I was very fortunate as well to train under Dr. Jim Swan um, for around six years. So that's, that's been a, a great step into the industry. Wow, what a fantastic uh, experience to have worked with uh, Dr. Jim Swan, such an incredible man. Yes, yeah, very much so. Thank you, Laura. And um, finally, last but not least, <laughs> clearly, uh, Ashley Frey, who is the co-founder of Frey Ranch Estate Distillery in Nevada. Ashley, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Ashley Frey, and I'm the co-founder of the Frey Ranch Distillery. We're a husband and wife team um, located in Nevada. And my role at the distillery is uh, primarily brand education, hospitality. I take the lead on a lot of our tasting and events. Um, and then also I took the lead most recently on our packaging. So quite a wide variety of uh, different roles that you've got at the distillery, Ashley. Right, yes, and as we were um, developing our distillery, we, my husband is a fifth generation Nevada farmer and we wanted to highlight the grains that we grew on the farm and we felt they were best expressed um, through a high quality whiskey. Fantastic. So the reason why we've, um, I suppose, brought all of you together is because you really represent um, a broad um, experience across the, the industry. So we have uh, marketing, female founders, uh, distribution uh, and distilling production roles all covered off here. So um, obviously it's very difficult to uh, include absolutely everyone in a discussion like this unless we wanted to go on for a few hours. So um, thank you so much for, for joining us and um, this fantastic representation of uh, the industry I think right here. What um, I'd like to just dive straight into um, just digging around and just discussing a bit about what the major challenges are that um, and I I hate this question as a journalist and as a, an ed a former editor of scotchwhiskey.com and um, the spirits business it was always something that was asked me and that I had contributors asking other women in, in whiskey and I always hated it. What is it like to be a woman in whiskey? And I always felt that was a question that shouldn't be asked because it shouldn't make any difference. But the, the issue, the reality is that it does actually make a difference. So I'm going to start off and maybe just asking Christy, first of all, what major challenges have you experienced as a woman during your career in whiskey? And, and how much has that changed since you first started out? Um, it's changed a lot, you know, <clears throat> I guess maybe, well, it was my parents that started the industry back here in Australia, or at least the boutique industry. And growing up, I was always part of it. But it's only recently that I've really realised that there is a lot of discrimination within the industry. You know, I've been running my own business for four years. My parents aren't involved. My dad certainly is not. And yet, at least on a weekly or if not monthly basis, somebody asks me, you know, what, what, how much work does my dad do in the distillery or does my dad do it for me or, you know, something along those same lines. Whereas my brother who's been working in the industry for the same amount of time, no one has ever asked him that question. They all straight away recognise that he's got ability even though he's been working in it for a lot less longer than me. And even he himself says that it's rubbish, that that shouldn't be the case, that my skills and ability shouldn't be questioned all the time. So I do come across it, I do find it. And, you know, that's part of why starting up the ADA was, AWDA, sorry, was really important for me to highlight women in the industry and that, you know, they are skilled. They don't need to have their skills questioned or their qualifications. So, yeah. 
is that is that something that you find other women who are a part of the um awda is do they have similar experiences to you they do um also they find it can be intimidating that um some of the men that they try and get questions off can inadvertently talk down to them um you know i myself have had the person i taught to distill come into my distillery and mansplain distilling to me um, so, you know, just all of that, it can be really off-putting to some women who, um, who are really new to the industry and, and are still finding their way and, and getting their foot. Yeah, I can imagine it's um, quite daunting for, for, for young women who are coming into the industry for the first time, who maybe don't have the experience of um maybe dealing with comments like that with with potential mansplaining or being spoken down to and who are potentially even um intimidated by what is perceived to be a be a man's industry um laura i want to put the question to you as well because obviously you work in you work in production at uh, at Pandaren, and to have worked under someone like jim swan as well for such a long time you're your wealth of knowledge is incredible, but ha what are the major challenges that you've experienced in, in your career so far and, and do they still exist? Um, I think much like Christy, um, one, of the, one of the big problems that I've had is that when we have contractors or you know, third parties come into the distillery, um, they make the, the, the assumption straight away that I'm a sales girl um, or that I'm the, the PA. Um, and I quite often get contractors who try to oversimplify things to me or don't bother trying to explain things to me because they, they think that I, I've got no idea what they're talking about anyway, so there's no point. Um, and that's incredibly frustrating. Um, and it's, it's quite nice to see the look on their face sometimes when I, I can prove them wrong, but it's really frustrating that we're in that situation. Um, likewise, our distillery supervisor, who I work very closely with, um, if we go into a meeting together with a, a contractor or a, a you know a sales rep, they will automatically shake his hand first, um, and they will they will talk directly across the table to him. They won't they won't make eye contact with me, um, and he he gets very offended on my behalf and says it's her you need to speak to. Um, but again, it's really frustrating that 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 even needs to be said. Um, I was very lucky, and one of the the things you you referenced Jim there, one of the things that Dr. Jim Swan um, made absolutely sure of was was that you, you were never in any doubt that you could do anything. He, he was a big believer that if you can do the job, you do the job, it, it really doesn't matter. And I, I never felt with Jim that, that he thought of us any differently because we were, you know, whether we were male or female, which is a, a really nice thing. And I think that the rest of the team in the distillery picked up on that. Um, and I, you know, because, because Jim accepted it, everybody else did. Um, but it's, it's incredibly frustrating to have to constantly sort of remind people that that you're there. It's it's a funny one that because obviously if you can do the job you can do the job and it shouldn't your gender shouldn't matter and to call out somebody for that um, attitude is, as being unique or special is really quite sad because it doesn't really necessarily exist it probably exists quite a lot in people's minds but the reality is that we still hold quite a lot of gender bias um, within us in our everyday you know experiences um, it may not be intentional but it's just this un this um gender bias which just exists with us. Judy, you're nodding quite a bit there and um, obviously working within the world of marketing and previously um, working over in India as well, you must have um, experienced quite a lot of challenges in your career so far. I think, um, I mean, look, I think the industry's come an incredibly long way, I would say, first off. And as I think about Diageo, I, I think 10 years ago, our executive committee was men only 100% men um, and now it's 40% women and actually I think on our board women outnumber men so I so I do think there has been some really big dramatic shifts that have happened um, it's certainly in the time that I have been in the industry which is great to see uh, I, I think you know I don't sort of share um, some of the experiences I think it's a little different um, if you're part of a big corporation, especially when, you know, Diageo are, you know, ha have done so much work in the IND space. I think it's sort of a bit less of a conversation, um, you know, when you work in that context, but it's great to see 
progress that the industry's made. And I think we're acknowledging, you know, there's a journey ahead of us. And, uh, and I think the, the examples from around the table, and I know there's more to come, are fascinating. Uh, and one of the things we spoke about before was the level to which actually some of these, it's just unconscious bias. No one's sort of deliberately setting out to, um, you know, suggest that Laura isn't like highly skilled. I just It's just the auto default option uh, that comes to people is perhaps that, that she does a different role to the one that she does. And I think, I know we'll come on and talk about it, but unconscious bias is, is still playing a really big role. So how deliberate we've got to be about changing that um, is part of what we need to do to move forward. Absolutely. And we're definitely going to be coming on to that in a bit. And I also want to come back to um, the, the fact that Diageo's board is at least 50% female too, um, and, and talk a bit more about how we can um, get a bit more rep um, more representation in our, in our leadership roles within whiskey as a whole. Um, Ashley, uh, I know um, you've, you've got some thoughts on this as well in terms of, um, as a woman, how you've been um, maybe represented in the media being a husband and wife um, team who have co-founded a distillery, <clears throat> you, you, you've mentioned to me before, it's often Colby who is who makes the headlines and who is the founder. Yeah, so um, exactly. A lot of times as, as co-founders, we would see, um, you know, the CEO and founder Colby Frey, and then afterwards, like with his wife, Ashley. And I felt like I'm so much more than just a wife in the distillery, we're co-founders, we're in this together. Um, Colby might be out on the tractor, he might be physically doing more distilling, but my role is just as important to him, to the distillery as his. And I feel like we're able to divide and conquer and take our strong points. And that's why we complement each other so well um, and able to produce a wonderful brand. But uh, definitely um, agree with what was said by the rest of the panelists. A lot of the times I am the only woman in the room. A lot of tastings we go to, um, there's only men there. And I, I love having more bourbon knowledge than them. It's something that I pride myself on. I think that my palate has grown amazingly um, over the years. And um, even so much more, I can pick up better taste than a lot of the men who are we're tasting with, so. Well, I think, you know, taste is so personal, it's so subjective as well. And it kind of, you know, it just goes to prove how much experience you have in this area. And it obviously, you know, that old, um, the saying that um, taste doesn't, um, taste buds don't have a gender. We just taste what we taste and it's based on our experiences. And, you know, why why should a guy know more about whiskey than, than anybody else? It just doesn't make um, any sense. Hill, um, you founded a dis whiskey distribution company in Hong Kong uh, at a time where there are very few female founded businesses and particularly even in whiskey. So what you must have faced some, some hurdles in, in the last six years. Uh, yeah, so similar experiences uh, as we've spoken before. Uh, when I started about like five years ago, um, uh, I was in a different industry before, so I didn't know anything about uh, food and beverages business in Hong Kong. So I basically just literally go to a bar, knock on the door. Hello, I'm Hill. I have a nice whiskey portfolio. Then um, a lot of times people, will, oh, okay, come and have a drink. So shall I pour you something, oh, what they call a girly drink? So not champagne or something, cocktail. And I was a little bit put off by that. It's like, a drink should not uh, be a gender base it should be just whatever one likes also uh, another instance is i've got a lot of questions so um so where's your boss can we talk to him and i'm like oh no i'm the founder i'm the only person in the uh, in the business um if you want to make a, a deal or talk about business talk shop let's, let's do it now so um luckily it has come a long way in five years forward uh, a lot of people um I'm much more open to this, uh, to, to be me being a boss and also in the whiskey business. Um, so definitely improvement over there. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I think what's so interesting is that every one of you has has mentioned uh, it's mostly this unconscious bias, which is like playing in here. Um, this perception that you couldn't possibly like whiskey or know anything about whiskey purely based on your your gender um, or even your age, because obviously um, being a young young woman working in this industry must play into that as well. 
certainly I have um, whenever I've been at um, a whiskey event um, as editor of scotchwhiskey.com uh, surrounded by some of my male colleagues and I've been mistaken for being the PA of some of the, the, the guys who work um, for me um, rather than being their boss and um, left out of conversations because I couldn't possibly know anything about whiskey and it's just this continuous um, issue of uh, people believing that you you maybe don't um, deserve the attention that maybe the other that the guys have and it's this this unconscious bias that you are um, don't have as much uh, experience or knowledge or, or, or are able to actually talk about this drink itself. So looking at it from a wider perspective now, so everybody has their own personal experiences and um, certainly over the last few months, I've been uh, messaged by quite a few women in the whiskey industry with very similar experiences too. Um, but looking at the wider landscape, there's obviously depends on each different market, um, the attitude, the progressiveness of the industry and where we're at now. But I guess from my perspective, I see that there are two ways of addressing this issue of whiskey being considered a man's world. World. One is with by creating uh, more diverse workforces and um, creating opportunities for women, and the other is through marketing. So I think there are those are two strands that I'd really like to um, like for us to address today. First of all, I'd like us to talk a bit about um, our internal workforces and and how drinks businesses can work to create more inclusive and diverse teams and, and spaces to work in. So I want to come to Julie first, because obviously, as you mentioned, Julie, um, at least 50% of the Adjo's board are women. And uh, I think I get this right, about 40% are in senior leadership roles as well. How how do you achieve that? How do we um, provide opportunities to uh, for women to move into senior leadership teams and to feel empowered and also welcome and comfortable to do their jobs? Yeah, I mean, look, I think firstly, I think businesses have to be very deliberate about setting out to do it um, because I don't think it naturally happens. Um, maybe it naturally happens now a bit more than it did. A decade ago but still it needs deliberate action to be taken I mean it's really interesting isn't it that that there's there's so many case studies done on the performance of businesses that have women in senior roles you know it, it's a very robust business case it makes sense we know those companies um perform far better but it does require businesses to take a real stand um, on that and actually create an infrastructure around inclusivity as well I mean you know one of the things uh, that, you, that you probably have seen that we launched last year is parental leave regardless of sex or gender um, so that enables women to come back to work if they want to and their partner um, to look after their baby you know so making sure you've got an infrastructure that surrounds an inclusive environment is is really important the business case is clear I think it needs us all to be deliberate I also think um, just having role models um, women in senior positions who actually pave the way for other people to one have a role model somebody that they you know perhaps look up to aspire to be who they look at and see oh if they can do it that means that I can do it because I think that builds confidence um, for people, um, but also paving the way, making sure that policies are in place. And by the way, it doesn't have to be women that create the policies, but just making sure that policies are in place to make the workforce, you know, truly inclusive, I think is key. And, you know, I think many, many businesses are on this journey and some are further progressed than others, um, but it is a journey and it takes very deliberate action would be my view. I agree. I think and, and every company is on its own journey as well. So I think so long as there are progressive steps being made and um, taken forward, um, it doesn't matter where you are on that journey. The important part is to just keep moving forward and keep keep on with this um, important work. Um, I Laura, agree. Just one other point, Becky, yeah. on that. I can see somebody's just put in the chat and I totally agree. Having mentors, having allies, they're not necessarily women. 
<laughs> but having allies that help create the conditions. Um, and my, my personal experience is actually since returning to work 10 years ago after my first maternity leave. Um, and actually I've always worked for men um, since then. Um, but actually they have all created the conditions and been allies. Um, and I think how we create conditions for women to be successful in the market, it's, or in, in, in business through allies, whether they're women or men, whatever, doesn't matter, but being very conscious about trying to create conditions for people to be successful is key. I agree, allies, it doesn't matter what gender, um, or what background they come from, um, everybody just needs to be helping each other to progress further. Um, and that was actually something um, I wanted to um, ask Laura about as well, because you mentioned, Laura, about your um, your teammates um, discouraging um, any unconscious bias that's directed towards you and cutting you out of conversations. But um, I, I feel like that's so important. How do you, because obviously at Pandaren, you have a, an all-female whiskey making team. You also, you know, the wider team does obviously involve guys as well. But how do you foster that, um, that I suppose, that family and um, supportive um, environment within Pendaren? Um, I think there are two points to that. So as you mentioned, we've got um, an all-female distilling team at Pendaren. Um, and I think one of the things that people quite often think is, and one of the comments that we quite often get, oh, that must be terrible. You know, you can imagine the, the gossiping and the, you know, and the, and the cat fights. And that's not true. You wouldn't say that about a group of men. Why is it acceptable to say it about a group of women? Um, and I think as women, we have to we have to show that we we can get on in the workplace, and we are professional, and we, you know, we we just get on with it. It's it's a job, and that's what we do. Um, so I think it's really really important, as as we were saying, to have role models and, and allies to to be part of a team um, and to to take you know take care of each other and, and have each other's backs. So be aware that that there is unconscious bias, and look out for it, and look out for our teammates in that point. Um, the other thing is that I am responsible for a team of, of nine, um, nine men. Um, and I think I can honestly say that they don't treat me any differently to, to anybody else. And I think the reason for that is that you have to show that you can do the job. You have to show that you're in that position, not because you're a female, not because you're a trophy, but because you can do the job. Um, I've had to prove that I can do what I'm asking them to, to do. I've had to prove that I'm willing to do just the same as them and that I don't want to be treated differently. If you start out asking to be treated differently or looking to be, you know, looking to make a point of the fact that you're female, people will then start going down that road of treating you differently. So I think it's it's been really important for me to to show that I am part of the team. I'm not I'm not a woman I, and they are not men. I'm part of the team. We're all on the same team. Mm. And I, on that point as well, I think it's really important. I, I think we'll probably come on to this later, but where women are, are in, in positions, I think it's important for both the, the employers and for the women to be very aware of that they are there, to be very aware that they are not, you know, they're not there as trophies. They are there and they've, they've got an image to portray to, to other women in the industry to, to take their position seriously and, and, and not sort of to themselves or, or women in general a, a disservice by you know, by sort of putting them down or, or not believing in, in themselves. Mm, I completely, you're, you're so right. It's, um, I think, every, you know, everybody has a responsibility to look out for one another, to support one another. And I like this, this idea of um, not singling yourself out as being special because of your gender or for any other reason. Um, you are part of a team and that's all you should be looked at is for your skills in, in the workplace and what you're bringing to the wider team as a whole. It's, it's about driving forward together. Um, Christy, I want to kind of flip the question on, on its head a little bit for you and, and ask you what, you know, if, if teams weren't supportive, if that kind of, um, support and calling out of any kind of sexist remarks or unconscious bias if that doesn't happen what are the implications of that kind of behavior i think there's huge implications it just you know it just perpetuates all of this stuff from ha of continuing to happen and that it really needs to come from the top down and that, that's the only way that it can be solved. You know, I look at a lot of, especially the smaller distilleries in Australia and the ones where 
there are women in the top positions or at least men who are, are happy to put women on, you find that, well, I find that women who are in the position of employment, um, women who are in the, sorry, women who are in the position of employment, um, they will employ the right person for the job, whereas men tend to employ men. And whether that's unconscious or whether it's just the way things are, it, it's certainly something that should be addressed and at least highlighted. And, you know, just recently having conversations with people about this panel and about what's been going on in the industry, I, I find that people who are sort of 45 and younger are really open to the fact that it's happening and that it needs to be addressed and they might not know how to fix it but at least they're having the conversation whereas older people specifically older men um like they just don't see it as a problem they don't see that it exists to them it's just you know women behaving emotionally which is the most irritating phrase on the planet um but yeah, and I did, I had a conversation with someone just recently that, and, and he told me that sexism in the industry doesn't exist, gender pay gap doesn't exist, employment differences don't exist. And, you know, even when I could name and show and highlight the fact that they do, they, they still want to believe that, that they're right and that it doesn't happen. Um. I think it's I think that's absolutely right that there's maybe a blinkered approach often from certain um, people or companies um, who don't want to believe that this exists and we're going to come on to marketing in a bit anyway but because you know whiskey has this traditional um, consumer base of, of, of men and whiskey has always been marketed that way as we know there are more women enjoying whiskey now so something has to change and it is an inconvenient truth for the brands who have staked their whole consumer base and their whole marketing campaigns around a certain demographic but it's starting to change now and no longer can you get away with just targeting to that demographic in the same way the cleaning industry the cleaning goods industry can't get away with just marketing um, floor cleaner and surface spray to only women obviously they're recognizing that everybody does their fair share of cleaning or at least they should do um, in the house so uh, things have to change actually I want to ask this question to you as well because as obviously as a, a female founder of a or sorry as a founder of a mm -hmm. distillery <laughs> you uh, you are um what how are you creating opportunities for um for women to uh succeed within the workplace i suppose to to grow and to learn and to um i suppose choose um distilling whiskey or otherwise as a career sure so i get asked oh sorry <laughs> oh, sorry <laughs> I think that one of the um, biggest things is allowing women to um, uh, grow in their positions. And we have several women that work for us. We have women that even work for us here on the farm. They drive tractors, they operate heavy machinery. And I love it. Like I love working alongside other women and allowing their potential and their experience to grow within their job and really highlighting that. Mm. And why is it why is it important to have um, a diverse team? Like what what is what what does that bring to the table for for you as a company? So I think it just allows us to kind of break down those barriers of a historically male dominated um, uh, industry, and I think it it helps us to uh, be diverse in in our brand. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to talk a little bit about. Um, like coming down to Hill and obviously this this kind of question of creating opportunities within the workplace is maybe not so applicable to you because you obviously are a, a, a one, one woman show <laughs> with whiskeys and more which is amazing that you can achieve all of that on your own quite honestly um but you you um there are some issues within the Asian markets that you've you've come across particularly around um uh, places like whiskey shows where uh, maybe the representation of brands that shows is uh, quite questionable. Um, yeah, so Asia, ex Japan, and uh, in some certain extent Taiwan, is still a very um, new, relatively new market to whiskey compared to Europe and the US. Um, so just to give you an idea, 
Uh, in China, a couple of years ago, there were just two big whiskey shows. And I think last year uh, and this year, there are already 10 plus. So it's growing very, very fast. Um, but uh, what I see also increasingly is that um, a lot of uh, at whiskey shows, a lot of promoters are, uh, they hire girls that don't actually know much about whiskeys, but just to uh, yeah, be for show and, and pour whiskeys in uh, very short skirts or um, I see more and more independent uh, bottlers with uh, very provocative uh, labels on it, which I fail to see the link between the label and the product itself. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's actually um, something to be addressed. And um, me as a distributor myself, um, I do talk to, to my brands and I discuss like, what is your strategy? What do you want to put as a company? And that's how I see as a distributor as um, yeah, the extension to the market and represent the same values and the same, same views of the brand. Um, and I think maybe for the bigger brands, they can do the same, look at distribution um, that represent uh, the company's reputation. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to, to, to think about is as a brand, how is, how is your brand communicated in all the different markets that you're present in from your importer and distributor all the way through to your representatives in that market and then down into the on and off trade accounts where you're present and how that's even being communicated to the consumer. There's a whole chain where every single wheel has its part to play in how your brand is represented um, and how ultimately your consumer is represented as well. Um, so Hill, when the, the brands that you're working with in Hong Kong, how are you, how are you, do you have these conversations with them? Are you like, how would you like to present them in, in your market? I think um, for now we don't have like a specific conversation about this topic but we have general conversations and then well you, you kind of get uh, the the stance or, or how they see how, what their perspectives are of, of just um, anything for, for the brand um, but it is a good point that um, there might be a discussion coming soon about these things yeah. mm -hmm. I think perhaps I mean hopefully off of the back of this particular conversation and and many more that are probably likely to come in future, hopefully everybody watching will will be making a note of those conversations to to have with their particular distributors. Um, yeah. I think um, that you know the other the other strain that we that we need to talk about when it comes to um, this perception of whiskey being a man's world and making it accessible for women, not only so that they um, see whiskey as being um, providing career opportunities and being an industry that they want and to work in and feel welcome to work in, we need to really look at how whiskey is marketed to consumers as a whole. Um, obviously, historically, whiskey has been marketed as a man's drink. The majority of adverts have been marketed towards men and any women who have appeared in those adverts have been in uh, maybe subservient um, positions or um, not featuring at all or in worst case scenarios um, quite sexualized. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm proud to work in an industry which seems to have moved away from a lot of that. Yet there are still instances of, um, again, unconscious bias towards men and women do not seem to be um, a consideration for quite a lot of brands. Now, I know um, definitely and this is where I'm sure Julie's going to be able to tell us a lot more about this. But Johnny Walker, I do believe, is one of the brands that's really excelled in trying to turn the image of scotch on its head um, and really market itself to as being a diverse drink for a diverse audience. Um, Julie, can you give us a little bit of a, a background in, into how that tr transition has taken place and, and the change in your consumer base that you've maybe seen off, as a result of that? Yeah, I mean, look, first of all, I, I would say uh, gender portrayal in advertising isn't only a challenge for this industry. It's a challenge for many industries um, and quite a hot topic um, at the moment. And, and it sort of feels like it's been a hot topic for quite a while, actually. Um, but a piece of work was done, I think, in 2017 by the Gina Davis Institute and uh, was shared at Cannes. Um, 
that year, which showed that despite a lot of conversation, actually the statistics show that not very much had changed over the decade from 2007 to 2017. So here we are in 2020 um, and for sure things are moving. I guess the question is, are they moving fast enough? Um, we've done a load of work at Diageo. We've looked, we, we did, uh, we took a look at 100 ads of our ads from around the world. We looked at them critically to say how well we were doing. Um, and we found that we'd made some strides, but we still had quite a long way to go. So we've done a ton of work on this. Um, and actually what we found was unconscious bias is a massive factor. Um, and you've got to work really hard to overcome that unconscious bias. Otherwise it's just there. And we all have un 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 unconscious bias. Um, so it's, it's not a, a man or a woman or anything, you know, um, it's just a fact. So having to design around that and make sure you can overcome it is critical. So we, we developed a framework a couple of years ago, um, which, we, which we use with all of our agencies, um, which allows us to look at creative development process, who we have behind the camera, who we have in front of the camera, representation in any, um, in any communication. So it's not just about TV advertising, it's about everything. Uh, who's represented um, and how are they represented, their characterization, and also whose perspective are we seeing the action from? And often that's, re that's really hard actually, it tends to be, or in the past has tended to be uh, more male. So we work hard to overcome that by, as I say, making sure we've got uh, women in front of and behind the camera as well. Uh, and, we're, and we're making progress. And I think the industry is making progress um, and there's still a way to go. Um, but if you look around, the world at communication on Johnny Walker you actually I think you'll find more women than men uh, quite dramatically more women than men actually um, at the moment and um, so we're designed for that we want to make the uh, category feel fresh vibrant totally inclusive and therefore we deliberately have to over index um, in order to create that um, within the category. So we're making progress, there's still a way to go. And I think um, across the industry, we all have to join hands, um, you know, taking these steps, making sure that we remove unconscious bias as best we can and use things like simple frameworks to make sure that we are portraying people um, in the most progressive way. Actually, it's not only a gender point, I should say, um, it's a, a, you know, a bigger movement about progressive portrayal um, of communities, race, sex, the whole, the whole thing. Um, but for the conversation today focused on gender, that's where we've probably made the most significant strides over the last four or five years. I, could, I, I agree um, wholeheartedly. I think there are, there are several brands in the, in the whiskey industry that are doing an amazing job at showcasing a really diverse face of, of whiskey drinker in, in their campaigns. Johnny Walker is certainly one of them. Um, I really love Hay Club as well and what, what's been happening on that brand too. It's almost like, um, I like this idea of a really simple framework for brands to work to. It's almost like the whiskey industry needs its own best gel test. Um, similar to the one that's used in the filmmaking industry where um, every every scene needs to adhere to a certain um, number, I think it's two or three uh, tests to ensure that um, it's not just women talking about men and it's not, you know, that, that women are actually shown with it on the screen as well. Incre I mean, I agree. And increasingly you see there are, there's movement around the world. So in the UK advertising standards, um, brought in new legislation a couple of years ago. What you're starting to see in, in the world of advertising is they are absolutely looking at progressive portrayal as, a, as an entry requirement for any entries. So creating great award-winning advertising absolutely has to be in this space. Um, and we just need all of industry to move together on that. Um, and I think quite quickly, if we move together, um, we can make a big difference. There is also entertainment and media um, that we need to think about as well. And often whiskey is portrayed, you know, um, in a successful businessman's hand, um, it, it, you know, in, in Hollywood, in Bollywood. And, you know, and so there's movement that needs to happen in, in other industries as well.
uh, you're absolutely right there. I, it's the brands that have the power. It, the messaging starts with the brands and then it filters down through to, to media, to journalists, to who work, write on newspapers and magazines. The way that women are um, conveyed in, in stories and articles, so not just as the wife of a founder of a distillery, um, not just as someone who works on a distilling team, but actually a distillery manager as... Um, really being highlighted for what our achievements are not as a female blender but as a blender um, and then all the way through into film and television as well and representation there. Um, Christy what's the situation in Australia how are women how are female whiskey drinkers portrayed in in the media in film and and by brands as well? Uh, great question. Um, like you, you know, if you if you do like you said earlier, if you do a search of, you know, women distillers, especially Australian women distillers or women in distilling, you just get you get all these poxy pictures of scantily clad women, and you know, you scroll down and maybe you might get one or two in a bond store who are actually working in a distillery or own a distillery, and. You know, there's still that it drives me crazy even even myself like I had a distributor on the mainland who took my products to a trade show and afterwards told me that they got scantily clad women to stand around hounding out samples who knew nothing about my product and it was just hang on this is never the path that I wanted to go down I'm always about integrity in the industry and you know using women in this forum or you know men or whatever in a in not a very good way to showcase a product whether it be whiskey or gin or whatever it's you know that's really great and yeah it's it's frustrating that there's not a lot of advertising in Australia alcohol is really heavily regulated um it's I guess it's more heavily regulated towards not being something that children might think is a product that they can consume it's not hasn't gone down the path of being you know gender um having gender awareness but there's a lot of distilleries um that still you know you log onto their front pages of their websites and it's all cigars and leather and you know hunting trophies and it's it just seems a little bit outdated that they've kind of forgotten that whiskey's moved forward mm. Is that is that something that you're considerate of when you're um, marketing your own products? Yes, definitely. I've made a huge conscious decision that I do not want to portray women in any of my advertising to be anything less than amazing, skilled and knowledgeable. So <laughs> you'll see no scantily clad women in any of my ads unless that, that's what they do. But, um, you know, I... I <laughs> To be fair, I don't do a lot of advertising, but the stuff that I do, it's it's more about the product. It's not about who's behind it or who's in front of it. It's it's about the product, and if you want to enjoy it, being a man or a woman or you know whatever, then that's how it's supposed to be. Mm. I want to throw this question across to to Ashley as well. Is that obviously you are? Um, the decision maker really behind uh, the way that your, your product, your brand is communicated. But how did you, is that a conscious decision for, for yourself as well? Is that something that you're, you're constantly bearing in mind how it's being perceived and that maybe the types of uh, people that you're using in your campaigns to, aside from yourself and Colby, of course, <laughs> um, who you're using to promote your, your, your products? Oh, absolutely. I think there's no room for scant scantily clad women in our brand either. It's not something that we stand for. Um, me and Colby are the face of the company. And if, if Colby's in the picture, I'm right there next to him as his equal. Um, and I think that one of the things that we've really done um, in our brand is take a look at the messaging and the promotions that we do. So for example, when we were thinking of our next barrel release program, um, we wanted to kind of frame it around Father's Day and we thought, you know, it would it'd be a great promotion. promotion. We took a step back and thought, why not Mother's Day and Father's Day? Because moms and women drink whiskey too. And, and why are all the whiskey promotions primarily around Father's Day? Why is that only 
the a men's drink. Why can't they be around Mother's Day? And, and why is um, Mother's Day sometimes the rosés or the girly drinks? And that's something that I really want to um, excel in our marketing program is including uh, Mother's Day and Father's Day together so that they're equals. I think that there's so much merit in that. And I, I do feel if more brands took Mother's Day as seriously as they took Father's Day, just imagine how big whiskey could grow. It's just been ignored. And, and what cost is there to that kind of uh, campaign to, to actually just run something that's similar to Father's Day? You've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. Uh, by doing that. I do kind of feel also that the representation of women in marketing isn't, um, sort of the negative representation of women in marketing isn't always just uh, restricted to um, uh, this sexualized image of, of a woman. It's so much bigger than that. And I think, Judy, you, you touched on this as well, this idea of um, a woman not being, um, she's just a prop for the main character in, in a story uh, storyline in a campaign, or um, her only worth is to be in a nice dress twirling around um, and not really um, providing anything to the storyline or like what's the point of her actually being there and what are you actually saying? And I think ev the context of everything, the way that the... The, the visual and the copy work together has such a profound impact. And there are so many campaigns that come to mind now that where women just aren't featured in the same, on the same stage as men, whether individually or not. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, look, I think it's, um, it's huge and it's, it's easy to get it wrong. So, you know, don't put a woman in an ad just because she's a woman. <laughs> put a woman in an ad or in a piece of communication or as your brand spokesperson because they've got character because they bring skill to it because they've got something to say it's it's exactly what everybody's been saying um you know in different ways whether it's about advertising or more generally in the industry um and there's loads of chat on the chat um about promoters um, and the role that they play as well and it's like you know have credible people who know and understand the category um, if it's in that context in advertising and in communication have women there that represent real character part of this Gina Davis work is really interesting um, I think the Gina Davis Institute had studied something like 2000 films so it's a very comprehensive study and what they found was men are 63 percent more likely to be shown as funny um, I, I think I can't remember the the, the stats but you know 75% of working characters are male, you know, so there's a lot that just goes on that just reinforces this sort of unconscious bias. Uh, so we're, you know, quite deliberate about kind of going, if you're going to cast women in advertising, or if you're going to use women to, to help market the brand in some way, make sure they're there for a very specific reason and because of their skills or character don't just put them there to be there. That's like the, that's worse than not having them there, um, in, in my opinion. I completely agree, completely agree that it, use a woman as part of your overall advertising campaign because uh, you're marketing to a broad audience. Don't just use women as, as icons and like, oh, we need to tick a box. That's not that's not going to help. And equally, um, you know, employing a, a woman as your a famous um, celebrity as your spokesperson in just because they're a famous celebrity is probably not um, going to do you any favours. Christy has a hand up. Can I add something to that? Yeah. I think a lot of the um, advertisers also fail to, to realise that, you know, 60 to 80% of discretionary spending is done by women and that women make decision purchases for the household. And it's just a huge market that a lot of the bigger companies have just failed to realise. It's just a massive, a massive part of the pie that they're completely missing out on. Absolutely. And whether whether it's a woman who's making a whiskey purchase for herself or as a gift for somebody else, would you not want that person to be walking into that store with more knowledge about the category because they're also interested in that category? Therefore, they're probably more likely to uh, to trade up as well to, to spend more on, on premium eyes. So it's kind of a win win, really. There's it, there's no, no way else around it. Um, Hill, I wanted to ask you about like what the representation of um, women in, in branding and advertising is in, in Hong Kong and, and Asia and what, what that's like. I'm, I kind of 
know the answer to this, I think. But I mean, the responsibility <laughs> that global brands have um, to um, represent a diverse space and who they're marketing it towards, surely it's like, is it not doing their, their brands a disservice to just continuously market solely at guys? What's, what's the situation? Yeah, so the advertising is still very male focused, although um, we already touched a point on this. Um, I think for the millennials uh, or uh, the generation below 45 in Hong Kong, uh, there are actually a big, um, a lot of uh, women drinking whiskey uh, because of the fact that we're very um, new to whiskey. So it was uh, it, it's seen as, oh, it's a new drink. Um, together with a uh, wine and cocktails so i just don't understand why um yeah there are no more gender neutral uh, advertising then um mm -hmm. yeah it would be do, do you think that if there was more gender neutral advertising then more women would be encouraged to drink whiskey um i think on the consumption side is is actually quite okay it's more for uh, the workforce so um, on the bar side, there are a lot of uh, female bartenders, but I don't see uh, that many uh, really knowledgeable uh, female um, whiskey expert or spirits experts um, in Hong Kong yet. Uh, I hope it's uh, coming. I, I see some uh, whiskey schools opening. So hopefully that that's, yeah, pave a path for more uh, female representative uh, here in Hong Kong and, and broader Asia. What do you think is the the, the barrier um, for entry for women to, to becoming more of a whiskey expert or working within whiskey within Asia? And if I mean, if, if there are more opportunities opening, that what's the barrier? What's what's stopping that representation? Um, I think it has also a little bit the uh, intimidation in in, um, um, in just in the industry environment. Um, like for me as well, if I go to a trade client. Yeah, um, you can go bar hop until like 2 a.m. And that might not be uh, very suitable for a young woman who just started in the industry. Um, so I think it, it just needs to change a little bit uh, the perception or how to do trade or, or um, yeah, that you don't need to keep on going to the same bar for 10 times doing shots with the bartender to get listed. These kind of little things. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's kind of um, creating that environment where both men and women feel comfortable to to work within it. So, um, particularly whiskey shows as well, which can obviously be um, very spirited um, environments. It can uh, it can very quickly turn into quite a scary environment for um, maybe women or other people who are feeling particularly vulnerable, um, are surrounded by. Uh, people who are particularly intoxicated and um, certainly I've had some some bad experiences there too um, I kind of feel like as well this this idea of um, mod, the use of models at whiskey shows to represent brands whether they're they're female or men um, I, I mean how likely is it that that's going to end in Asia is that is there a movement to stop that um, I think it has also is a bit to do with the culture. It is still very traditional. Um, even if you compare to other industries, I, I believe in, in, in Asia, um, the people in the board are still very male dominated compared to uh, US and uh, um, Europe. So it has to, uh, yeah, it will take a couple of decades, I guess, to, to change these little things. Um, and it has to start with, I think, education, uh, have more role models to show women that don't be afraid to dream whatever you want to do, whether it's uh, being a whiskey expert or uh, dream big being a female entrepreneur. Um, yeah, it starts from, from yeah, educating the young people to, to dream big and, and do what you think you can do. And don't be uh, afraid of because you're a female. Oh no, I later on I have to get married, get kids and all these things. No, it, it, you, you still can chase after your dream and, and yeah, do what you want to do. 
so well said absolutely it's it's all about having really strong female icons within within the industry that that others newcomers can look up to and really learn from and be inspired by and people like well everyone who's on this panel right now quite honestly it's a bit intimidating um there's been a couple of comments um in the chat which i think are really interesting i'd like to sort of look at so um one person has said how uh, they feel their social media algorithm doesn't allow them to reach any uh, female accounts, uh, just 15% of their posts reach women. Um, and then there's there's another post here from, from Claire, which I think is interesting. I'd like to, to, to see what people think about this. Um, there are social media accounts that exist which are not affiliated with a brand in particular, but um, maybe the owners of those accounts uh, dress particularly provocatively um, and are quite suggestive in some of the content. Um, do, does anyone have any thoughts on those kinds of accounts? Um, I mean, on one hand, surely that's up to the creator to do whatever they want with. They're not affiliated with a brand, so that's up to them. But also, on the other hand, is that not just perpetuating the image that we're just trying to, we've discussed just now, that we're trying to eradicate? Um, Laura, do you have any thoughts on that at all? Yeah, so I, I mean, it's important to, to know that we're not, we're not going to be able to change some things. Um, if those accounts aren't affiliated with a brand, that we are limited in what we can do. Um, but going back to a point that I think Helen made um, a few moments ago, that it, it's just like when you walk into a show as a woman who is knowledgeable about whiskey if you walk into a show and you see the really the girls clad in leather um or bikini selling vodka or, or offering whiskey tastes it it puts you down you know people don't take you seriously because because they they see another reflection um across the room and it's it's just like that um and i think it's really important to try and get across to those those account owners if we can if we're able to because quite a lot of the time they're not really reachable um but if we can get across to them that we need to look at the bigger picture we need to work as a team um they are doing women in in any industry a disservice and um, by selling themselves short and i think it's really important to as a as a woman in in not just this industry but in any industry to know your worth and to not send yourself short and to to do what you can to to help push things on for for you and and for women in the future. Um, having said that, as I say, it, it can be very difficult to to reach some of, some of these people, um, and it may not be a very effective way of of getting change through through very quickly. Mm. I suppose it, you know it's down to the reach of these kinds of accounts. Um, I mean, certainly I've been disappointed to see um, colleagues throughout the the whiskey industry, male colleagues in the whiskey industry, liking and engaging on these kinds of posts, um, which I feel is, um, or, or even posting on their own social media um, uh, pictures of themselves with some of the models at whiskey shows, um, with some pretty questionable captions, and you just, I think. This is why I think it's so important to have these conversations because I don't think um, many sort of realize the repercussions of that kind of behavior and um, the, the way it makes um, women uh, within the whiskey industry feel uh, when they're kind of interacting with um, this, um, this image of, of a woman working in whiskey. Um, Julie, you're, you're sort of nodding your, your head a bit there. Is that something you agree with? Yeah, look, look, I think um, I, I was watching the chat um, and I think generally there's a consensus that nobody likes it, but the, that, as Laura said, it, you know, there's some stuff you can control and there's there's some stuff that you can't. Uh, that That's why I think that as an industry coming together and having, sta you know, standards around, you know, promoters, um, you know that should be an industry collective standards around how we communicate about our brands things like you know your platform becky r whiskey you know having you know as much positive uh, portrayal as we can i think is 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 the only way but i think you know in the not too distant future it's gonna 
I mean, it already feels a bit cringy and embarrassing to us, doesn't it, when we think about the sort of images you're talking about. But I think, you know, that will be a collective, oh, that feels like really wrong to do, if as an industry, we are all, you know, pushing very hard in terms of this progressive portrayal, whether that's through advertising communication, choosing to uh, promote our, our brands on Mother's Day, you know, whatever it is, whatever actions we're taking, I think collectively we can make quite a big difference. Mm. I think the, the more brands as well, as you say, that, 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 that do this, that really portray women in an inclusive way, um, creating those opportunities within their companies and then talking about those women within their companies and not just once a, once a year on International Women's Day, but yes. all year round. And I can think of some amazing examples of the salaries that are already doing that, which is incredible. Um, I think the, the, the more that companies do that collectively, uh, the, the more the, the quicker change will come about and I don't necessarily think we'll see it in our lifetimes and I've said this before but my hope is that one day we can all walk into a bar and never be asked the question um, do we want ice in our whiskey or for the whiskey glass to be automatically handed to the guy that we're with um, that's the dream <laughs> and uh, hopefully never be um, talked down to again in our line of work and just be have it assumed that we know what we're talking about um, I, there are a few questions coming in on the Q&A, which I want to get to in a minute. So um, we've got um, maybe about 15 minutes left or so of this um, session. So if anybody watching has any particular questions for the panel, the chat has been just buzzing and I'm finding it hard to keep up with everything that's going on on there. So it's so, it's so exciting that everyone's really uh, fired up by this chat, but I can't see if there are any particular questions in there for the panel. So if you want to ask something, please put it in the Q&A. Uh, you can do it as a, an anonymous question if you want to, um, but put it there and we can get to it. Um, there is one that has come in and it is actually something which I wanted to, to come to now anyway. Um, this, uh, this idea of, well, I want to ask the panel one at a time, what advice do you have for the next generation of women who are coming into the industry? Um, let's start with Ashley. So I think um, that's such a great question and I think we need to pay it forward. And I, I agree with Laura when she mentioned that we are a team. Um, and I think that we need to be proud and confident of who we are. And we've paved the way for so many amazing women to come forward. And there's so many amazing women who paved the way for me. I know, for example, Heather Green with um, the Millium, Millium and Green Distillery out of Texas. Um, she's an amazing role model for me because not only does she have a great palate, but she's an amazing businesswoman, CEO of her company. And I think just paying that forward um, and being proud of what we do will help others step up and, um, and start this journey with us. Good. Yeah, I, I, I hope that more people will come into the industry. Um, and you're right, it takes people like ourselves to lead by example and um, keep keep talking about it, keep having conversations keep like this. talking about it, right. Mm -hmm. um, Laura, um, as this distillery manager, I mean, two questions really. One is, um, do, you, like, do you find that there's much interest from women to move into production roles? And also, what advice do you have for, for women who do want to pursue that as a career? Um, personally, sadly, at the moment, I, I'm not often asked um, by, by women how they can get into the production roles. Um, we probably about two or three years ago now, we put out an, an advertising campaign to recruit for a trainee uh, distiller. And as you can expect, we got a ridiculous number of applications. Um, but very few of them were, were from women. Um, and certainly very few of the, the serious applications were from women, um, which was a real shame. It wasn't really surprising, but it was a real shame. Um, and in, in the end, the, the, the person that we hired was a woman, um, not, not because she was a woman, but she was genuinely the best person um, in, the, in the shortlist when it came down to it. Um, but certainly when I go to, to sort of trade shows and things, I get asked constantly by by men at those shows. Oh, that's great! You know, can I can I do your job? You know, if you need if you need any help, I'll come and do it. But I never ever get that comment from a woman. 
Um, so I think we've got quite a long way to go. Maybe it's because they've got this, this unconscious bias that, that they can't do it, you know, this, this feeling they can't do it. So this, it doesn't even enter into their mind. Um, but it would be really wonderful if, if people felt, if women felt that they were able to, to say that. Um, and sorry, could you just remind me of your second question? I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess what, what advice would you give to those women who are potentially maybe considering a career but not quite sure how to go about it? What I would say is um, know your worth. So you've got just as much right and ability to do that, to do that role and to be in that position as anybody else. You don't start off on the back foot just because you're a female. So if you want to, to do that role, do it, apply for it um, and keep pushing. Don't, don't sit and wait for somebody to give you a quality and to give you the same opportunities as, as a man would have. We have to take some personal responsibility as women and we have to go out and make things happen. Yes, sometimes in, in some industries and in some situations, we are um, perhaps discriminated against or, or perhaps not given the same opportunities, but it's up to us to, to push and to keep pushing. Um, I like to think that I'm in the position I'm in now because when opportunities came up, I stuck my hand up and said, yeah, I can do it. You know, when, when I was asked, I didn't sort of say, I can't do that, that's a man's job. You know, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll try it. And, and it's really important as women that, that we do that. We don't sell ourselves short, we take personal responsibility and we push ourselves forward. Great answer. I really like that. It's um, hopefully if anybody's watching and is considering a career in, on the production side, um, it's, you know, put yourself out there and, and see what opportunities there are around. Um, there are obviously plenty of um, ways to, to gain qualifications, whether that's through um, the Institute of Brewing and Distilling or Harriet Watt or the uh, WSCT. There's, there's plenty of, of ways to get involved. And uh, I know there's, there are, there is movement as well to create um, opportunities for um, people from diverse backgrounds um, uh, scholarships for qualifications. So there is movement there. Um, I'm not sure what's available currently, but um, my understanding is that um, there may be some new opportunities moving into 2021. So um, to watch that space. Uh, Hill, what, um, same question to you really, what advice would you have for, for any women who are wanting to get into the whiskey industry, maybe even um, setting up their own whiskey distribu distribution company? Um, yeah, I agree totally with, uh, with Laura. Um, yes, uh, also just speak up. Uh, maybe the first job that you get into in the industry might not be the, uh, the best one that fits you, but don't be scared and, and um, yeah. So for example, if you get into a sales job, that might not be your thing. Don't be afraid to stay in the whiskey industry, but look for something else to go grow and uh, see what fits your personality. And yeah, just, just see yourself as an equal. Don't be afraid because you're female, you cannot do certain things. Mm. Yeah. I think that's great advice for, for anyone looking for a career in anything really is particularly the whiskey industry is there are so many different roles available like the, whether that's in production or marketing sales brand management uh, behind the bar writing about it even there's just so much opportunity and um, so I think that that's a great advice for anybody who's looking for a career for sure just um, try different try different roles play about work to your strengths and your passions, ultimately. Yeah, totally. yeah, yeah, good shout. Christy, same question to you. What advice do you have for um, young women who are coming into the whiskey industry? Yeah, I agree with Hill and Laura, but also want to add that, you know, don't be put off if you can't, if your dream job is head distiller of a certain distillery, don't be put off by starting in the cellar door. You know, everyone, at least in the distilling industry in Australia, has started off either you know, right at the bottom, I did, I started off being the floor sweeper and the glass washer and stuff and worked my way up. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to be the head of a department within two months. It's, it's, it's a long game. It's not a short game. So, you know, don't do that. Don't, don't stress if you've got to start off in a different department and then you can move across. Also, you know, I really, I really like the idea that if, you know, I can open the door for someone and or if I've opened a door for myself to walk through, then I leave that open for someone else and give other people the opportunity. And, you know, with the Australian Women in Distilling Association, we're really heavily on educating women within the industry. And so we're going to be launching our next scholarship um, early in the new year. And it's 
it, it's really exciting to be able to educate women in the industry and you know hear their experiences and and watch their self-worth grow and don't underestimate your self-worth like Laura said you know just really believe in yourself you know <laughs> I see I see quite regularly um experienced women applying for the same job as men but undervaluing their own experience and their own knowledge whereas men will just be like yeah man I'm rad hot at this and they'll just go for it just if, like she said if you get the opportunity take it that's so true it's a, a lot of it is about not supporting yourself there's and this goes across like every industry as well as women need to know their self-worth and and ask for what you think you're worth not what you think you can get away with being paid uh just yeah i i, I think that's just such great advice um so we are slightly about to run out of time so i want to come across to some of these questions in the q a box there's some brilliant ones in here so it's quite difficult to, to choose which ones i'm going to um jump in with this one uh mark gillespie has um put this question he says there's a great question in the chat from dana dickerson uh she says if i'm planning a whiskey marketing campaign uh with a digital magazine What's the one thing I should push our agency to do to ensure we're representing women? And what is the one thing I should not do to ensure we're not alienating women? I think this is probably one for Julie, I think. Unless anyone else has any thoughts. I'm happy to have a crack at it. So um, I know you're asking for one thing. It is quite hard to, to say it in one, but there are, there are there's open access to progressive portrayal frameworks. If you Google it online, Unilever, Diageo, United Nations, we have worked together to collaborate on that. So I would speak to the agency about really getting up to speed with that. That's gonna help them take out the unconscious bias and be very deliberate about what they need to think about. I think, uh, I mean, and then the point around not alienating women, I actually think, um, we can be quite sensible about that. Uh, actually, great advertising and communication, whether it's digital or wherever it is, appeals to people in general, not necessarily men or women. So I think just searching out for great work, but making sure you get the portrayal, you know, get the portrayal right by using one of these frameworks would really help. And if anybody wants to follow up, um, we can find a way of sharing the Diageo one, which is open access. We very happy to share it because we would love more people in the industry pushing in the same direction. Fantastic. I will we'll try and get that out to uh, as many of you as possible if anyone's interested. Um, I think it, if I can add something to that, I think it's an important thing, um, not just the uh, digital agency you might be working with or the media you're working with, but also the PR company that you employ as well. And I think with any new partnership that you take on, ensuring that your partners understand your positioning when it comes to uh, ensuring that you're, you're marketing towards a, a diverse audience and you have diverse representation as well because what you don't want is, for instance, at a new PR company, um, a junior um, a, a junior writing a press release for you, which has all of the wrong messaging in there, things that you would never want your brand to say, and then sending that out to the press, which has happened very recently with quite a big whiskey brand, which had to be recalled and all members of the press called and uh, apologized to quite profusely. So I think there's there's something in making sure your um, PR, well, all of your partners are on the same page. Um, and when you maybe when you start with a new partner, when you do sign that contract with them to um, find out what their understanding is of the whiskey landscape and who the modern whiskey drinker is nowadays, making sure that they are on the same page as you, because they will have unconscious bias as well. Their perception of who drinks whiskey is based on everything that all of our consumers have been seeing through all these years as well. So don't assume that they know better. Make sure that you educate them as well and have those conversations with them. I think just to add to that as well, Becky, if I may, uh, having agencies, people who work on our behalf, distributors, whoever it is, understand 
the potential for growth of whiskey with women, as you say, 36% consumption at the moment, that definitely has quite a lot of room for growth. And I love Ashley's point around like Father's Day and Mother's Day. I just, it really stuck with me when we spoke about that a couple of weeks ago, Ashley. I think that's just such great unconscious biases. You automatically go to Father's Day. It'd be fantastic if we had these agencies, distributors, all thinking quite differently about how to market whiskey. And then just to add one other thing, when Becky had mentioned um, double check your agency's work as a brand that's fairly new, I can't stress that enough for those of the um, viewers that are watching. Um, so many times I see things and I think, oh, that sounds great, you know, hit send. But I think making that conscious effort to be inclusive and make sure that we're representing our brand as women founders and co-founders in the best possible light is so important as we move forward. Yeah, definitely. Um, we've probably got time for maybe one or two um, more questions. Um, this one in from uh, Anna Hints. Uh, I think I've said that right. I'm so sorry if I haven't. Um, does anyone have any advice for someone interested in learning about blending? So I guess we'll maybe throw this to Christy. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Um... <laughs> <laughs> uh, just like I said before, just knock on doors, ask if, if it's something that, that you want to understand more of, just start trying more whiskies as well, going to different, going to different whiskey nights, understanding the differences between, you know, bourbon and um, more single malts and, and that kind of thing. It's, it, it's really important. And okay, that's not specific blending as such, but um, there's also nosing kits and kits that you can get online that help you with that kind of thing. So you can do some knowledge at home and then yeah, just keep, keep knocking on doors, asking if there's, you know, traineeships or whatever that some of the bigger distilleries might have. Um, as a smaller distillery, that's for me, that's all done in-house and it's all done by me. Um, but that's not to say that those opportunities won't exist in the future. So, yeah, just keep in touch with people. Great answer. Um, and I think probably just the, the final one, but it, which I think is... Um, an important one uh, for, for people who are watching who are maybe not necessarily just in the whiskey industry or even enjoy whiskey as a consumer what can what can consumers do to help change the perception of, of whiskey and, and sexism in the industry what what role do consumers play here throwing that out to the whole team the whole board <laughs> I guess you can uh, always vote with your money um, so if there's things that you don't like, stop supporting those brands or, you know, approach them, send them an email. Or if you're going to a bar and you notice that the person next to you has asked for whiskey and they've been, you know, hit with one of those crappy comebacks of wouldn't you prefer a girly drink or whatever, call out the bartender. You know, you don't have to do it in a rude, aggressive, nasty way, but you can you can still say something and, you know, it helps to educate people if you do that, we can't just be complacent, you know, at the same time, we don't have to be rude or nasty, but just, you know, keep calling it out. Yeah, definitely. Laura. Yeah, so I, I would echo what Kirsty said there. Um, and I'd say it's really important to go a step further. And if you're, if your partners or your brothers or your, your dads or whatever, if you see them making uh, a comment or, you know, what's, what's that girl doing drinking whiskey or, something like that, an old fashioned comment or an out place comment, call them out on it. You can do it in a nice way, um, but I'll, I'll quite often say it to my, my brother or my, my partner, you know, make them know that because often it is an unconscious bias and they don't realize what they're saying. And you, you have to sort of say, look at it from my point of view. And in the same way, you know, I'm, I'm very clear with my children that, that we don't have, you know, male roles and female roles we need to if we're going to stop the unconscious bias we have to we have to start and it, it will take a very long time um but if children don't have that unconscious bias and they're not going to grow up to have it and um, so I, I think that's really important um and and i think that's that's just so hugely important and also call out brands you know 
if you've got social media in in this day and age, you can you can reply to a brand immediately on social media on Twitter. However, you can do it, you'll get an instant response. Do it. It it gets to somebody in in the brand. It makes it known, and also other people see that. The great thing is that you don't have to write a, a letter that only goes to somebody at at the company anymore. If you write it on social media, everybody sees it, and that's that's a great way of of getting your view to a to a huge audience. I can speak to that. <laughs> obviously <laughs> recent events um but th there is power in that and I think showing your I think quite a lot of the time it is a, you know as we said this word so often unconscious bias from from a brand not really realizing what's been said so actually just saying something bringing it to their attention I would say the majority of times um people don't even realize what they've said or done or how it can be construed or seen in a different way so it's just a case of it's education um and I think educating at every opportunity um and 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 as you said I think who is it Christy said about calling out the bartender if there's any um uh, bias there towards like whatever it is you're ordering whether that's a, a beer or a cosmopolitan or pint of guinness or a whiskey um drinks don't have genders and there's a really great advertising campaign by heineken um which is a uh, men drink cocktails too or something it's called that so you go and search for it because it's it's fantastic it really brings the the whole issue to life and it could they could very well just be talking about women and whiskey there rather than uh, men and cocktails but it's um it's wonderful um I'm aware that we've hit 90 minutes and this has been so much to take in. We've really covered so many different points and it's been amazing to try and follow along this chat as we've uh, been uh, discussing everything. It's been quite like all over the place. There's been some amazing points raised and uh, not least, you know, this this discussion is all about gender. Obviously, there's um, more that we could even talk about in, in regards to representation um, when it comes to um disabilities and um sexual orientation as well so really um, um, and race obviously so representing um a diverse face and uh, our whiskey has the hashtag modern face of whiskey which i think today it's um it's never been more important for for the industry to unite to really not only appeal to that modern audience but to encourage a more um diverse workforce as well um I'm going to say thank you so much to um, everyone who's joined us, in particular our panel, Ashley, Laura, Hill, Christy, Julie. Uh, thank you so much to Distill Ventures and Heidi for um, allowing this to happen, for, for bringing us all together to, to talk about this. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks everybody. That was just um, so inspiring. You're all our amazing leaders in the industry and thanks for everyone who participated in an excellent conversation. So this will be um, available. We'll be sending out a link afterwards. So if you wanted to watch any of this back, then you can do. Um, so that will be on the uh, the Soul Ventures website and I think YouTube as well. So we'll send out a link. Um, but in the meantime, um, please go and follow Distill Ventures. Um, I'm going to do a shout out for our whiskey. Please go and follow our whiskey as well because there'll be more to come on this topic going forward. And um, yeah, have a great evening, morning or afternoon as the Truman Show would say, wherever you are. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Becky.